probably do, and, and probably for every possible communication uh, system, is first you want to capture these packages. Then you want, uh, so, so they're called bursts in GSM. Um, just a naming thing, but it's just a package. Really. Um, that those bursts are decrypted, uh, if they are encrypted. And then you'll want to interpret them. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll go by these points in the reverse direction, so we'll start at number three, because there's more to say about number one. So, uh, interpreting the decrypted bursts. Uh, you have all kinds of choices here, uh, thanks to all kinds of open source projects. Uh, you have a GSM decode program running in AirProbe. AirProbe is an open source GSM sniffer. Uh, so in development, uh, really, because it, it can't uh, sniff everything yet. But uh, this, is, this is one of the ways. Uh, Wireshark, the newest wire, new old versions of Wireshark have a GSM stack. And OpenBTS, OpenBSC, both open source projects, really cool ones, that uh, just uh, make an open source implementation of uh, items inside the GSM network. So, um, uh, OpenBTS will, will run you a... So, so they're not meant to work together or something, right? Because uh, as both of them just... Uh, if you have OpenBSC running on a computer, you'll have, need to have a, uh, a, a, a cell tower connected to it, a, a nano cell or something like that. And then you can run your GSM network. And OpenBTS will run on uh, uh, the USRP radio, which I'll come to. But which is just a an, an software radio device uh, that will pick up and, and send out signals. So you have all kinds of choices here. Perhaps you'll need to tweak something, but uh, this won't be the, 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 the hardest part of the day. Decrypting the bursts. Uh, I was fortunate enough that so this, this tool was released, I think, a month ago or something, uh, and they called it Cracking, so I can use this picture. So I really like it. Um, uh, they, uh, uh, okay, so, so A51 was just uh, reverse engineered in 1994, which is not entirely so, somewhere between 1994 and 1998. There's all kinds of uh, academical papers breaking the alleged A51 cipher in the meantime. I'm not sure if anything really changed in between, but mostly we say 1994. And as I said, there were many academic breaks quite easily. Uh, there's just so there's some things are, are not really okay in cipher, uh, but those those attacks really never came to anything. So I think the best attack from that time is uh, an attack by Gronich, which ran in, in a complexity of two to the power of forty point something, which was still way too much at that time. So to really practically do something, and we started seeing more time memory trade-off attacks. Um, and this is also uh, the latest batch of attacks that uh, have been in the news and stuff and, and, and all kinds of conferences. And this actually began way earlier, so uh, I believe Shamir also and, and, and Aman, uh, they already wrote that this was definitely possible and, and gave an idea of how you should do this. Uh, at some point uh, there were two guys, David Hutton and I forget the other guy. In 2007 they were at the CCC conference in Berlin. And they announced, well, we are going to build tables. That's basically what you mostly do in a time memory trade-off. You, you make an entire code book in which you can re reverse look up uh, a key given a piece of cipher text. Now, that's what they were going to do. And uh, they announced this, and, and they had a, a, a gigantic amount of, of FPGAs and, and I don't know what. And they were going to have to compute this for eight months. And actually, in the presentation, they said, uh, so they started the presentation, I think, with uh, ask me at the end uh, why we are announcing this publicly. So, of course, someone asked this, and they gave a list of uh, three, three, four people or something who <laughs> had been busy trying to uh, crack A51, either, either by tables or other means, and uh, that simply stopped doing it, didn't want to talk about it, vanished, stuff like that. Uh, that didn't really help for them because they had to compute for eight months and somewhere after the seventh month they seemed to have thrown away everything they computed and do not wish to talk about it with anybody. So it's a dangerous business cracking A51. Huh? Uh, now, current, so, so then we had uh, Carsten Noll who uh, presented at HAR a uh, similar attempt, only the, the one big difference here was uh, everyone can compute this at home. 
uh, like a sort of SETI project using graphical cards. Uh, and, and if everyone computes parts of the table, shares them via BitTorrent, then there's nobody who can stop this, right? So, so you'd have to take out uh, a lot of people and then probably the, the providers aren't going that far. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, so the tables were actually ready somewhere in December last year. Uh, in the meantime, new tables have been computed that actually now just took one month to compute on a machine with four graphical cards, graphics cards. Uh, because, well, graphic card can compute a lot of things in parallel, right? so that's why this, this was a much better idea. And, uh, and they, they made a new set, which is now called the Berlin set. Uh, so if you want to start doing this, you have to look up which ones you're downloading, because you can just download a set, uh, over a terabyte of data, which is useless. Now, uh, you have to download something that's called the Berlin set. Uh, it's a, a bit smarter attempt, uh, uh, but basically the same. Uh, it uses some, some funny stuff, but uh, ask me uh, afterwards if you want to know. So, uh, and they, they released it to Kraken, and Kraken will use these tables to look up your uh, keys. Because what you do is, you, you, once you've captured a burst, you uh, guess its contents. So if you, um, you, you need to have some known plain text. Because if you have no plain text, you can just XOR it with the uh, encrypted burst, and you'll get a key stream. And key stream is sort of part of this one-time packet which was used to encrypt the entire message. And uh, this table basically just lists uh, session keys to, um, uh, to, to pieces of key stream. Now, it's a rainbow table, it's, it's impossible, well, improbable, to uh, store all possible where you have 2 to the power 64 possible internal states, 2 to the power 64 possible session keys. Um, actually, it's 2 to the power 54, uh, because for some reason, uh, when designing this, they decided to, okay, so we're generating a session key 2 to the power 64, there are also 64 bits, we'll just drop the last uh, 10 and zero them out. Which is, well, it can't have been to, to, increase, to enhance the security, but who knows? Um, uh, and, uh, and this table just, if, if, if it happens that this part of key stream is in the table, then it will know the, this, the session key. Um, then we come to step one. And step one is, is, this has always been the hard part. Capturing the stuff in the air. So GSM has been broken for, well, 15 years or something. But it was so damn hard to get the signals out of the air. Uh, because equipment to do this is very expensive. And it, uh, people just couldn't manage. Then uh, the, the software development of software, that's SDR, software defined radio, started taking off, especially with this device, the USRP. It's a universal software radio peripheral. It just uh, is connected to your computer and it uh, can receive all kinds, of, on all kinds of frequencies, it can receive and send and you can do with it whatever you want, basically. And it will send those uh, samples that it gets off the air to the computer. So this is a, a picture of USRB, USRP1, which has a USB 2.0 port. Uh, the USRP2 actually has a, a, a gigabit Ethernet port to connect to your computer. So you can get a lot more data from that. Now, then you run it on with some software, GNU Radio is a the logical choice, and AirProp on top of that, which just invokes uh, methods from GNU Radio, which will cause the USRP to sample a certain frequency at a certain rate, uh, with a certain decimation, and demodulate the signal, and all that kind of stuff you don't want to worry about. And you'll receive uh, a signal, also just uh, values of these signals in your computer that you can interpret. So we're all looking at hacking this <coughs> interface, right? The air interface between the phone and the cell tower. Because it's everywhere, right? I mean, you just have to hook up an antenna and go. Um, it's, uh, uh, the, the air interface between those two are, are usually divided in a part that's uplink, part that's downlink. And uh, the, those the parts are again divided in channels. This is uh, the setup, actually, of the, the base station uh, that I can receive from my office. 
um, uh, they numbered all the, the uh, all the channels. So if you get a, a channel 94 uh, assigned to you, then you will transmit on the upper uh, uh, the lower 94 one, and you'll uh, receive on the upper 94 one. So. Now you'd say that that uh, phone calls will go like this. I just pick a channel and, and communicate, but that's not what happens. What really happens is more like this. It hops around in between four channels, uh, and this is uh, this is what makes the capturing of the of, of the, the signals really tough. So this is actually not a security measure, right? So the the GSMA uh, said, well, uh, we have another security measure, and, and, and hacks are calling it now uh, another security measure we've breached. This was always meant as uh, a sort of, a sort of uh, general, um, I say, just a, a, a quality of service idea. So you just, uh, if you transmit on a lot of frequencies, then uh, most of the packages will get a sort of average quality instead of one guy getting assigned a channel, which is really crappy, and, and because you cannot uh, say. Well, in, in this area, channel 17 will be very good or something. You know, buildings can come up and, and all kinds of stuff can interfere. You don't know before that. So uh, uh, this, is, this is pretty common in, in all kinds of wireless uh, networks. But it was never meant as a, a, a security feature. Now, the trick is that the information on how it, the, the signal will hop, so on which channels and in which uh, sequence, um, at what point that the, the, do the phone and the mast uh, agree upon that, or actually the mast just commands it? But, so, uh, if at that point encryption has already started, uh, then it becomes really tough to, to listen on QSM calls. I'll get that here. So, if you, uh, for instance, you're paged with your mobile phone um, uh, for an incoming call, then you'll uh, respond to the mast saying, oh, well, I uh, uh, got a page from you, I request a channel. Actually, you just request a channel, he assigns you a channel, and then you can, and because there's one common channel where everyone can shout on, and then you get a channel assigned, and you'll say, okay, well, um, uh, on that channel, you'll say, well, I've got a call from you, uh, I'll, I wish to answer it. And then at some point, uh, the mast will say, okay, start cipher." And you'll respond with saying, OK, I started ciphering. And from this moment on, all communication is encrypted. Now, then some other information is exchanged. And at the end, at some point, the speech channels are signed. Now, so if this happens after the encryption step, um, then, then you have a real problem. <laughs> now, there are three ways to assign this. They're both, uh, all three are defined. I, uh, with the top of my head, I think there's only one that uh, has this information sent encrypted. <coughs> But it's basically the only one I've ever seen. So I hear stories about uh, in other countries or something where, where they do uh, share this information publicly, uh, but I've never seen it. So. And that gives you a hopping problem, which is fine on a hacking for beer conference where hop is usually a much more positive thing. But in this case, it prevents us really from, from being uh, you know, uh, able to, to listen in on GSM. Just because if there are enough channels and they are widespread, you just don't know where to listen at what time. You can try to get them all, but it's hard and it takes a lot of computation. And this really, uh, I believe, has not been done, at least not by you know, hackers and people who publicly admit to this. Another attack, a man-in-the-middle attack. If you have this, uh, the same picture as you just saw, a, man, a attacker could go and sit in the middle, because, I mean, uh, if he has, a, if he, he causes your phone to connect to him and access your phone towards the real base station, there's nothing preventing him from this, because uh, uh, he just has to identify himself. So the funny part is, there's a broadcast channel, and a GSM cell tower will just transmit a number on it, saying, "Okay, I'm in this country," and it will transmit another number saying, "I'm this provider." Uh, if you uh, you just use the same numbers, then um, oh, off you go. So if I send 204.004, I get I act as my own provider, KPN in uh, in the Netherlands, 